Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is not... I, I have come here quite a few times, so I'm glad to be here again. So um, the, the subject I'm going to talk to you about is, I think, is going to be a bit of an isolated point in this, in this school, but I think that it's worthwhile, um, it's worthwhile seeing, seeing it, especially because it is something that is uh, shared between uh, several fields that uh, often don't talk to each other. So it's nice to be able to see these things simultaneously. So, uh, first of all, uh, ah, please stop me as many times as you. I, 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 I won't, uh, I'm not in a hurry. In fact, this is not so long. So you can stop me all the times you want. So, let us talk about quasi-integrable systems. These are systems, I'm going to define them better, but uh, systems that uh, can uh, be integrated. This is the technical point. Uh, the not technical point, the more physical thing, is that these are systems that move in phase space in a sort of laminar way. Um, the main historical example is planetary systems, uh, where as you studied at school, you have the Kepler problem, and then you study several planets. Each one follows an orbit that you can calculate a la, a la Newton, a la Kepler, and then they perturb one another a little bit, and this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, and that's precisely where the word perturbation comes from. It comes from one, one, um, one planet bothering the others. So uh, then um, weakly nonlinear waves is another very mm, common, very ubiquitous subject, when you have waves, the, each wave is like a harmonic oscillator, but then when they, then they interact, and when they interact, all these oscillators that were integrable cease to be. Then you have these two examples, which I'm going to discuss in more detail. So, planets. So the planets give you the Kepler, or if you want to be a little bit more advanced, the Laplace-Lagrange approach, uh, each planet is an integrable motion that you can calculate. You know it moves on an ellipse whose uh, characteristics don't change with time. Uh, the Laplace-Lagrange approach is a very clever trick. Instead of studying planets like this, you say, okay, for very, very long times, let me pass this film quickly, and what I would see is like a kind of ring of mass, and this one would produce like a kind of another ring, and in this approximation where you consider the entire orbits as rings of mass that are interacting, that's the approach that Laplace and Lagrange did. And then there is a perturbation, clearly, because these things uh, will disturb one another. And so, uh, integrability is broken, which means, technically, that we cannot solve it easily, but more importantly, it means that chaos will set in, which wasn't there before. So, just a word about chaos. I will mention frequently the Lyapunov exponent. So, as you know, it, Chaos is defined as, if in phase space I start with a trajectory and I start with a nearby, nearby one, in a chaotic system, this small distance amplifies over time in a way that when you're chaotic tends to be exponential. And this thing is called the Lyapunov exponent. This happens when you have chaos, and instead, when the system is integrable, you don't. You have an ellipse. If you start a planet in another position, you will have a slightly different ellipse, but as you see, there is no exponential separation of orbits. Okay, so when I talk about chaos, I'm going to think about this situation, 
And uh, one way of measuring it that will come back again, uh, many times is the Lyapunov exponent, which has the dimensions of inverse time. Okay, so you could ask what happens when one planet perturbs the others. Are these orbits going to become unstable? Is the Earth going to end up by blowing away or falling on top of the Sun? This was the first uh, great motivation to study this kind of systems, and was a question already at the times of Laplace and Lagrange, and uh, even not so long ago, like 20 something years ago, people thought that uh, the, well, the perturbations could perhaps not uh, destroy the solar system, and the, that the solar system could in fact not be chaotic, thanks to a theorem which is called the kolmogorov arnold moser theorem that tells you that when you perturb a little bit a system, then you get regions of phase space where it's almost as if it would be uh, integrable. In fact, that's not the case. And we know now this list doesn't have an enormous meaning, but uh, if you calculate the upon of exponents of planets, now you can do this, you put the orbits in the computer and with much, not much imagination, you can imagine two Earths, two copies of the Earth, and you find that the typical time at which orbits separate in the solar system is around five million years, which, is, which means that the chaos time is around that time. Yes? Well, that's uh, a plan from a good plan for a half of the talk that I'm giving. Uh, excellent. So yes, uh, we have this, but five million years already should uh, raise the question that Srikant is, is asking. I mean, five million years is an extremely short time. We we were around, uh, or people think that were a bit like us were around five million years ago. So the the time of life of the of the solar system is around 5 billion years. So that's something that begs an explanation. Indeed, if, if you can do more, these, this is not these days, this is Lascar some, I don't know, 20 years ago or more. You simulate the orbit of Mercury, this is the eccentricity of Mercury, I think that this is the same thing, and, uh, and you start all the planets in slightly different positions, but then you let this simulation go for five billion years. And you find that some orbits, eccentricity grows so much, one means that the eccentricity of Mercury's orbit is the same as uh, Venus. So it's a mess. No? Uh, so by five billion years, you have uh, more or less, I don't know, one, two percent of, of the orbits have Mercury going away, probably crashing against Venus, and God knows what happens after. So five billion is more like the age of the, of the solar system, and is the time in which we are more or less safe that it will be here. So, but this is a gigantic time, as, as Rikan Moses was asking, compared to the only five million of the chaos time. That is something that we will have to we will have to try to explain, or to give ourselves some sort of explanation. The interesting point is that it is no longer true. I mean, and, and this is something that mm, people don't usually know this, that there is, uh, th that what is clearly and definitely by now absolutely known is that the solar system is chaotic. Okay. Uh, weakly interacting waves is a, is a subject that is uh, practiced by other people that usually don't do planets, and, uh, and, and of which the planetary people don't know, uh, don't care. Um, when you have waves in, in water, for example, uh, to a first approximation, they are, as I said before, like, like modes of a string. They are just like a harmonic oscillator, each one of them but they interact through higher orders. And 
there are many cases when the interaction is relatively weak, and this happens in the sea when you, when the sea is relative is calm, you see you see these waves almost propagating, but of course they interact, they dissipate, they do things. Um, and uh, for example, this is an experiment where you get a, a sheet of steel and you make it vibrate, and you see how the energy dissipates in a cascade from the long wave to the shorter. This is called wave turbulence. Turbulence is, it's not turbulence, but it's called turbulence because you have a cascade of energy going from the, where you excite the waves to shorter and longer waves and then so on. So, and, okay, this is again another subject where you're studying an integrable system plus a, a, a perturbation. Now, the, this is perhaps one of the best known examples. I, I, I don't know how much you've heard of this. In the 50s, um, Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam, but instigated this, wanted to see assist thermalizing because if we teach students that a system that is not integrable ends up by being ergodic, but they at the time didn't have much concrete examples. And this was the beginning of computer. And so they, they, they proposed to, to study this model. So you have particles on a chain that are interacting through they said, okay, if I do it quadratic, it's not enough because it's, it's completely integrable. Like the Fourier modes don't talk to one another. But if I add a, a, up to quartic, it should, cube, I, I add up to quartic, it should be okay. So they put this in their first simulation, and to their great surprise, they found that at the beginning it seemed like a wave. They started with some bizarre initial condition. They, that the system was trying to, to decay, but in the end it came back to where it started, and so, so the lump of energy with which it started, it, it seemed to, to spread as you would expect, but then it, it concentrated again, and, and they were very surprised by this, and because this is not what they expected. Once they add the quartic potential and the cubic, there are no longer Fourier modes. This is a strongly coupled system, so what, what, what the hell was happening? And it took a long, long time to have a simple explanation for this phenomenon, but now we understand it, and I'm going to come back a lot to this. If you do the following exercise, you take this uh, potential and you rewrite it for an appropriate lambda and changing of variables, you rewrite it like this. So I write it as an exponential plus, well, this thing, and then of course there are lots of terms that uh, are here that are not there, I make the first three coincide, and then whatever I put that was too much, I take it away. That's a small. So I'm writing the potential as something plus small, so small in the sense that it's higher powers, which are going to be more negligible for lower energies. But the nice thing of this is that this potential, when you have a chain with this potential, then it is integrable, and it's a highly non-trivial thing. It's called the Toda chain, and uh, I'm going to tell you more or less how you prove this, but it's nothing as simple as simple waves that are traveling. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, there should be a P squared here. Yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. And, and in the Toda too, of course. <coughs> the Toda is without the small. Exactly. So, at the end of the day, what you understand is, again, you are in a situation where you have integrable plus perturbation. Sorry? It should be? Oh, I didn't put the P squared. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this is V. Uh, okay. So, this is, a, this is a system that, in this sense, resembles very much uh, 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 nonlinear waves and the uh, planetary systems. In fact, if you look at the trajectories of the particles, so what is this plot? Um, you, 
you have your chain. So I start with a chain at time zero. And this is going to be time. And I'm going to plot this trajectory, this other trajectory, this other trajectory, this other, and this other. And that's exactly what I plotted, uh, sorry, here. And uh, you don't see much, but you see it here, for example. These are pieces of trajectories. And can you see these things? These are not particles, because as you see, you have no particles that can move very far. What you have here is a shock wave that is traveling through the system. Yes? That's a, a perturbation of harmonic chain is what people were doing at the beginning. It's integral plus something, but it's a, you, you miss the good integral, the best integrable. Then it took a long while to realize that the better one to do it is Toda, which already is much closer. So yes, we do use Fourier modes, and you can see Fourier modes here, but you also see these beasts that are shocks that are traveling. And these beasts don't exist in a harmonic chain, but do exist in Toda. Fourier mode, sorry. In harmonic chain, we have normal modes, but in Toda chain, we don't have normal modes, right? So You have something that is uh, the analog of normal modes, which I'm going to mention in a second, but uh, which at one extreme of the scale in the short wavelengths resemble a lot the harmonic modes of, a, of just oscillators. But if you go to the other extreme of the, of the spectrum, uh, those modes give you these solitudes. So, so it's a richer, much richer situation. Uh, of course, we don't know how to do as many things as we, as we do know how to do with Fourier uh, transformation and so on, but still you do have modes which have this interpretation. And it's not only, by the way, this thing, but you have this beast, I don't know if you can see it here, is called a breather. This is a, a localized thing that exists only in discrete systems, not in continuous systems. And it's extremely chaotic set of, like a fight of three dogs uh, moving, but the, the identity of who are the three changes, and it's a very chaotic thing that, that moves across the system. Okay, so this is what Fermi, and what happened to poor these two poor gentlemen, plus the, the, the woman, uh, Tsipu, who's omitted from the history, uh, who did this, uh, they, um, they fell into a situation which was small, because they couldn't go, and it was short time, but still they had these solitons resurrecting. Of course, they, they were not aware of this, but these solitons eventually die and are born elsewhere and so on. But if you are in a very short time, which is what you could have in the 50s, you wouldn't see that. We will talk a lot. There is no threshold. There is no threshold, and uh, there is no sharp threshold. It's a matter of degree. The lower the energy, the more it takes for the system to, to, to thermalize, but there is no threshold. Uh, the threshold idea comes from the KAM theorem, which unfortunately is a, is a brilliant piece of mathematics, but it's a bad influence on people because it's completely irrelevant if you have more than three or four degrees of freedom. It never plays a role. And it, it, it's very hard for people to get convinced, being, it being such a brilliant piece of mathematics. Uh, so the, um, the, this, this KAM theorem says that when you turn on a perturbation that breaks integrability, at the beginning, not much happens. At the beginning, meaning when the perturbation is small. 
and you get essentially some chaotic regions in phase space and some that are not. And people thought that in this chain, as well as in the planets, this could be the case, but no. And the quick answer is don't expect a system which has 10 degrees of freedom that are talking to one another to have such a thing. They will, but at such ridiculously low level of interaction that it has to be irrelevant. Oh, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, uh, uh, it has to have the sign so that it's stable. I hope I got it right. So, CAM theorem cannot explain the Fermi Pashtalum problem? Not at that? all. Not at all. And it's a common uh, misconception which, which I had and other people had to think it can. But uh, what, uh, and this, this I talk about. Uh, low dimensionality, meaning no number of degrees of freedom, is a disease uh, that has to be cured. Uh, we, we tend to think in low dimensions, we tend to think of chaotic problems or even glassy problems with few degrees of freedom. But all, and, 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 and because we can do pictures of the blackboard, but uh, almost everything that is interesting comes from having many degrees of freedom. And, uh, Applying the CAM theorem to such situations is a low dimensional prejudice. But don't get me started with that because I, I get very enthusiastic. So, um, quantum chains are very fashionable. There are, you know, spin chains or, or, or fermion chains in one dimension uh, that are uh, often integrable. Why, why do I say often? This is quantum integrability, but still, it's something similar. What happens is that when you do experiments, uh, now we can do experiments on this with cold atoms, for example, and with, uh, we, we create a lattice with uh, optical uh, confinement, and when you do a lattice in one dimension, what you end up by having is something that is not very far from uh, very um, delta-like potentials. And the problem is that the um, system in one dimension, delta potentials, is integrable. It's called a lib linear model. And so you're always close to lib linear because of technological reasons. So this created a back and forth that has been very strong between experimental people and analytical people. And uh, this is a very, very active and very fashionable field of research. I'm not going to go much on this, but uh, I'm going to mention in passing some quantum things because it, most of many ideas you can export from one to the other, from classical to quantum. Okay, now the simplest example with a quasi-conservation. This is the, 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 the model of level zero. So you have a glass of water at temperature T1 and another one at temperature T2. They are both in equilibrium and now you connect them with a little wire that allows heat to go from one to the other. Assume it's very thin. So uh, you can approximate this situation, which now it's an out of equilibrium situation because we have two different temperatures. Um, you, could, you know that you can approximate this with the Gibbs measure for each one separately, beta being the inverse temperature. But uh, a more elegant way would be to do the sum and the difference of the energies. This is just, and the sum and the difference of these temperatures, inverse temperatures, and write it like this. What is the nice thing? The nice thing is that E plus, which is the sum of these two, is conserved, and E minus is not. And E minus, which is the difference of the two energies, is exactly what the little wire is making go uh, down to zero. Okay, so you have one quantity that is conserved and another one that very slowly is going to zero by virtue of the breaking of the conservation law. Um, okay, so we will keep this example in mind because it's the most concrete example of something that has two well, has two constants of motion, one strict and the other one almost there, okay? Which is the case in all the systems we were describing before. 
planets have the Kepler elements of the orbits of each planet, which are constants of motion if they don't disturb each other. But when they do, they lose all these constants, or, or these constants become approximate, and the only one that remains is the total energy and the total angular momentum. And the same can be said of Fermi Pastaulam with respect to the total constants of motion. I will come back to this. Okay, so a bit more in detail, what is an integrable system? In classical mechanics, you can, um, the P's and the Q's, the, the X's and the, and the momenta, you can change variables to new coordinates and new momenta, and if you chose the good ones, then you go to what is called action angle variables, which have the, these action are the conserved quantities, and these are the conjugate quantities, and the motion is laminar, as you can see here. Angle variable in this case would be the one that describes how you move around this circle, and the action has to do with the area that is uh, spanned by the particle when it moves. So in action angle, you can change variables. Hamilton's equation are the same because these are just a particular set of coordinates and momenta, but uh, you did it on purpose so that the momenta are the conserved ones, and so you can see that the only thing that happens is that the angle goes around. And that motion is pictorically, forget this for a second, this motion is pictorically on a torus. The angle variable is this one, and the i variables label the torus. So when I will talk about tori, what I will mean is that I have an integrable system, and I am moving, conserving these conserved quantities, and moving along the conjugate angle. And you see that angles and constants give you the topology of a torus just to the Cartesian product of two, and you have this, cross this, and you get a torus. Okay? Do this n times, and you get a generic situation. Okay, and now when you break it for some reason, the integrability, your constants of motion are non, no longer constants. They are, let, I will be only interested in cases in which it's slightly broken, and you move away from the torus to another torus, but very slowly. So we are going to have in mind a situation where you move on the torus almost happily as if you were integrable, but because integrability is lost, slowly this drifts to another situation. Okay? So, for example, the orbit of a planet is an ellipse, which is nice and Keplerian, only that the parameters of this Kepler orbit are changing very, very slowly with time, and that is our situation, our meaning the Earth. For planets... Uh, for a, a system like Fermi Pastaulam, I think that uh, Srikant asked the question, uh, the thing is, will it, uh, will it thermalize? So it's captured in this tori, that because it's almost integral, it's almost toda, and then eventually moving around from one torus to the other, thanks to non-integrability, it will uh, explore the entire energy surface. So you, you move, at, at, which is the only remaining constant of motion of that problem. For the solar system, what the analog of being ergodic is simply losing your stability, because as you know, the gravity problem doesn't have, it's unbounded. So to say that you become ergodic is, the, the analog of becoming ergodic is just going away. So the question of what is the time of ergodicity and the question of what is the time of survival for the solar system are, are similar questions. Okay, so uh, the question that we asked before, how is it possible that the Lyapunov exponent is at the inverse of 5 million years, so it's very, very chaotic, and yet 5 million years we are confident that the solar system is very stable. How, how is this possible? And the answer is, and I will tell you how I know, that, and it's a bit surprising, is that you do have trajectories that diverge very quickly, as soon as you perturb, but most of the separation of trajectories happens flatly on the surface of the torus. So, on a shortish scale, you are very chaotically 
exploring these, tor these torus that may have a number of dimensions, and on a much longer scale, you diffuse away. That's the answer to the apparent uh, delay paradox. Why is it that a system can be very chaotic and yet quite stable? How do we know this? I, I don't know really. It may have been something with a different language that even Laplace and Lagrange knew. I don't, I don't really know. But the way I, I got very convinced of this is, is very simple. We were studying a system that is integrable, but we added a little bit of noise. Epsilon is uh, a small number, uh, and this is white noise. So now the system doesn't have energy conservation because you are disturbing it with a random field. But you can calculate the, everything of this model. You can beat it to death for simple potentials. And what you find is that immediately, but really immediately, as soon as you connect to some white noise, the system immediately becomes chaotic. Not chaotic in the sense that makes a noisy dynamics, but in the sense that two starting conditions with the same noise but slightly different will diverge one from the other. And it is in that case that you can prove that almost all chaos happens on the surface of the door. In this case, you can kill the problem, you can map it to a lovely paper of the 70s or something like that on localization, in quantum mechanics in a random put you can use this to completely beat to death the problem and to your surprise you find that there is no threshold of chaos as soon as you add an epsilon you are going to have a Lyapunov exponent which scales as the third power of this so there is no threshold and but Essentially, what happens is that you, you move very chaotically on the torus, and then you diffuse at an extremely slower scale. Now, so mathematically, what do you do? You change these equations to action and angle. When you change the equations, the perturbation, as you see, appears as a noise, the, the noise we started with, but multiplied by variables of the system. So it becomes a system of multiplicative noise, and that's the origin of all the chaos in, in this practical example. Just a quick thing. But you now can make the sort of leap of faith that a system like the solar system, or like Toda plus small, also known as Tadipastaulam, are a bit as if they would be perturbed by noise. They are not. They are perturbed by different parts of the system, but that their Lyapunov exponents are so large that because essentially all of it is spent on the tori. When, um, when I gave a talk on this, on the, on the simple example perturbed by noise, there was somebody in the audience, Benetin, who's a big expert on Fermi Pastaulam, and he said, now I understand why, because he had computed the Lyapunov exponents of Fermi Pastaulam and found that indeed the system is very chaotic. The Lyapunov time was 10 to the 4. And then for the same parameters, he computed the equilibration time and it was 10 to the 8. And he was extremely puzzled by this. How can it be possible that a system takes so much longer to equilibrate than it takes to explore, that, than its Lyapunov time? And to this, you, have, you must answer that the situation is very close to the one, fortunately, of our solar system, which has a big Lyapunov exponent and uh, hopefully a long, much longer stability time. At least. Um, I would say no. I would say no. Just to go to the, well, not directly. Just take this example. If the Lyapunov exponent, this is a system of one half times 10, 10 to the 23 particles to the left and one half times 10 to the 23 particles to the right, the Lyapunov exponent is what it is of each one of these glasses of water. The combined one, oh, what happened? It's back. Uh, the combined uh, Lyapunov exponent is gigantic. Ah, it's 
knife. Uh, I don't think so. Sure. Okay, I behave better. Okay, so uh, the Lyapunov exponent is what it is, something to do with a not far from the collision time of molecules. However, the equilibration time, as you can see, has to do with this little channel. So you see, it's, it's nothing to do. Okay, so, uh, but one has to be aware of this. It takes a while. So, now let us concentrate for a minute in Fermi Pasta Ulam. So this is a way to solve it. Uh, you're not going to see anything, and you're not supposed to. Uh, you can write this matrix and this matrix, which is called a Lax pair, the matrices are defined here. This is what, these are the momenta, these are the uh, positions. This is the Toda Hamiltonian. And uh, the equation of motion, you can write it like this. This is what Lax realized that you could do. And in this way, you can show that the matrix itself and all its eigenvalues are a constant of motion. So that all the spectrum, all the eigenvalues of the matrix are the constants of motion of Toda. That, that's, and uh, about the question, what about, are they like Fourier modes? Well, of these eigenvalues, you have a string of them. I will call them J1, Jn. The big Js are almost as big Fourier modes, but the small ones are long modes, but also some solitons that you don't have in a, in a normal harmonic chain. Okay? Uh, so... Uh, this was done much better, by ben uh, much before, by Benetin and Porno. They did it with a harmonic, uh, as, as, as your question. The, the, they chose, because it was easier, the simple integrable system consisting of just a harmonic chain. And so they started a Fermi Pasta Ulam chain in one given, uh, they put the energy in the, lowest, in the lowest Fourier modes, and then they let it go and saw how these energy dispersed along the mode and to get something that is more or less flat. This was a way to see equilibration. So what we did is we took their idea, but expressed somewhere else in the paper, and did the same idea, but we did it with these Ks are the Toda constants of motion. Remember that uh, Fermi Pastaulam is not quite Toda, but it's almost. So we put a lot of energy in the lowest, I call them modes, but don't think of them as Fourier modes. There are some cousins of Fourier modes appropriate for Toda. And we looked at how time went on. Uh, they had done the same with Fourier. We just improved a little bit on this by using the Toda ones. This is with uh, Tomer Goldfried, I should say. And uh, so you, you put a bunch here, and you see as time passes how very slowly the distribution of energy in these constants of motion begins to spread. If we were in Toda, pure Toda, we would stay and die here, which is what you see there is a red curve superposed. That's when you do a real Toda. And this slowly going away has to do with the fact that you're not quite in Toda, but you are breaking integrability. Think of this in analogy with the orbit of Mercury slowly going away, and of all planets, or um, waves in water slowly interchanging their energies. Uh, uh, this one, we tried to check that it, it was sort of self-averaging in a way. Uh, to the extent that you can, we, were in 300 or something, chain of things. So we, we, we tried. Yes, yes, and indeed, uh, I think that you can do the scalings of all these laws. Uh, there have been things done to, to estimate at each energy what, uh, how, how the different time scale. Notice that this is, is and is not glassiness. You could have asked three come the same question. Uh, it is slow dynamics, but not for the reasons of glasses. It is breaking or Difficulty with ergodicity, but for another reason. How are they related to action variables? How are the ac uh, these eigenvalues? Are, these are, well, they are not exactly action variables. The action value, I'm not a big expert, but the action variables of Toda are, are sort of misty. Uh, you don't have so, but they are constants of motion. So they are sort of combina nonlinear combinations of those. Uh, but uh, you don't have explicit expressions for everything. That's the nice thing about waves, you know, that you, there you know everything. So analyzing the eigenvalues give us an idea about 
how action variables behave. Is that what you... Yes, the eigenvalues are just... Uh, uh, contain exactly the same information as the action variables, only that they are mixed up. Okay. So, uh, we did this. And now, one thing, I stop for a minute, because this is, we, we're entering fashionable territory. When you have a situation like this one, where you have a distribution along many uh, constants of motion, it has been proposed that you can write this as an ensemble where you introduce Lagrange multipliers that play the same role that temperature plays with energy, but one for each constant. You see, the idea is just like you have inverse temperature with energy, uh, magnetic field with magnetization, and so on and so forth. Here, the idea is you do it for all the constants. You could do it, and then you have to discuss how many of those. Do, if I have n constants, do I use n of those, and I have n temperatures, uh, or shall I, as is necessary for some cases, uh, do the plot, this is the plots you saw before, artist view, and do binning, and only introduce some betas to impose some boxes. It depends. It, it depends on if you want to use a thermodynamic limit or not. I leave it at that, but it's an important point. This strategy is called a generalized Gibbs ensemble, and it is very, very used, and, and there's a lot of activity in quantum chains. And it's there where the subject explodes. But you understand the, the, the rationale for this. So, coarse graining or not, coarse graining is an optional. You could have added one or the other. Technically, let me tell you in two words what happens. If I introduce exactly n temperatures conjugate to n constants, I have a right to do it. But then when you do equivalence of ensemble, there is a moment where you want to take a subtle point. For those of you who've gone through. And to have a subtle point, you need a big parameter. But you've lost your big parameter because you have as many temperatures as variables. So the binning comes from having something that doesn't fluctuate. So the answer is, uh, you are allowed to use this generic ensemble with as many as you want. But if you want to take subtle points, you better do some coarse grain. OK. So here what we did is we took it's the same picture as before. We, we excited certain modes, just like uh, Mr. Fermi Pasta Ulam and Madame Tsingu did. We excited a few modes, and this is the, the list of the, the, the histogram of the Toda constants at one time and at another. But what is fun is to see that this is a Toda system for one value, and this is also a Toda system. You're moving from one Toda torus to the other. So it's not that you were in a torus and it blew up. You were in a torus and you landed in another torus. Uh, if the system is big, it will be deterministic. And this brings us back again up on coarse graining and things like that. But if it's a solar system, no, because Mercury in some realizations can explode and in others not. So it's a fluctuating quantity. Okay, but. You have to think of hopping between torus and torus. In the, uh, it's a slow evolution of the Toda constants. Again, I'm not sure, because whenever people talk about Harnold diffusion, I, what I understand is something relatively low dimensional, and, or maybe not, I don't know, this might be my own limitation. They start, we talk about the tori and the whiskers and this and that. Here you're in high dimensions. A lot of the things that happen, happen because you are on the torus, you are perturbed. Shall you go out to a bigger torus or to a smaller? Well, entropy tells you out. This kind of reasoning in three, four dimensions doesn't apply. This is again why um, I think really that when one thinks about systems like Toda, one has to put aside, or at least take with a, a lot of grains of salt, everything that comes from the literature of low-dimensional chaos. I, because a lot of it can be misleading. I don't know.
No. Does. Yes. Yes. Because the low dimensional picture is that you have this laminar motion in tori, and then you apply uh, some chaotic thing, and some regions become chaotic, and others remain with nice tori that stay forever. In large dimensions, or in more than three dimensions, what happens is that this thing, this regime, is mostly irrelevant, and what you have is that all tori are, are destroyed, in the sense that none of them keeps being eternally stable. But if you consider a, regi a certain regime of times, you can sort of think that adiabatically you move from one to the other. So it's a slightly different picture. I don't know if it is or not contained in the Arnold thing. So yes, yes, yes. Uh, so two different sets of temperatures, of generalized temperatures. Uh, OK. So we did this algorithm, which uh, we, d we did it for Fermi Pasta Ulam, and there I'm pretty certain that it hasn't been applied this way. But I always wonder about planets. Uh, it's very simple. What you do is you are at this torus. You want to accelerate this part of the dynamics, which is the nasty one, the going from one torus to the other. So you move along this torus, and you estimate the velocity of these constants of motion, how quickly they are changing. This takes a short time because you, you do it on the torus. You don't wait for diffusion to happen. Then you do the jump by using these velocities. So j of t plus delta t equals j of t plus delta t times the velocity of j. Find a new constants. Find some point with those new constants. That's easy. You have the constants. You have to find a point. You do a little Monte Carlo program that does it. And then restart. So what you're doing is you're only doing the fast dynamics on the tori and the jumps you're estimating. You could do the same with Mercury, and I wonder, I mean, I, I haven't, we, I have discussed a bit, we have discussed a bit with people that are more knowledgeable of planetary things than us, but it would be a reasonable way to do an acceleration of the dynamics of, the, of a planetary system. Okay, it works, more or less, it works. And the, the idea would be, can I do the same here? So I, I, I calculate how much is, are the diffusion properties of uh, the orbit of Mercury at one orbit, I make it jump with this diffusion law artificially, start with a new orbit, and so on and so forth. It's, as you can imagine, something that could have been thought of in the 30s or, or even before, so you wouldn't be surprised. Okay, finally, a fluctuation theorem. So, uh, <clears throat> one thing we know, let's go back to our example. One thing we know uh, where a fluctuation theorem applies, have you seen it in this school? No, in the last one. Anyway, it's very simple what it says. If you have a thermal bath, this is really a big glass of water, and this is another big glass of water, and you suddenly connect them with a little wire, and uh, because the wire is so thin, the passage of heat is very, very small, almost comparable to, so that we can even see the fluctuations of this quantity. So it's made of eight molecules, okay, so that we can see. And so you run the experiment during a minute now, and you run it again in another moment, and so on, and you do a histogram of how much heat passes over a minute. And now, this is a histogram, and now you ask yourself, the histogram means... P of the heat that passes. So typically, it goes mostly from hot to cold, but you have some rare occasions, repetitions of the experiment, where it has the opposite sign. What you can show in the first version, this was uh, Abhishek uh, Dar and that, that proved it. In the latter version that I'm going to, it's Chris Jarsinski. 
if you calculate the probability that the heat passage is something divided by the probability that it is minus that something, the, the, this quotient gives you e to the beta something, which means that if you take the log of this part of the curve, it has all the, the, the odd coefficients are only beta times heat. It's only linear. And then everything else is even in heat. This is completely general. It doesn't depend on anything. Uh, it, originally, this comes from the 90s for other contexts. In the context of heat transport, transport uh, it was done a bit later. And then uh, Jan Siske Wojcik did it for two glasses of water, let's say. Uh, and it's completely noticed that nothing of the model enters here, which is a bit mysterious. Okay, so this is, this is the, so now in view of this, I could ask, well, but we said that this was a kind of zero level model for um, a system that is almost has to, yeah. This one? Yeah, this one too. This one too. Sorry, yes, sorry. Here, it should have beta minus, yes. It's, yeah. Uh, so yeah, sorry about that, thanks. Um, so, so, because this was the, an inspiring thing of something that had two constants of motion, one exact and the other one approximate, and the minus one was the one that is changing, this immediately suggests that you should be able to write a fluctuation theorem for a system that is weakly integrable. And indeed, you can. Uh, in several, the, the, when we did it for a system that is relaxing, we then found that there were other versions with the same quantities, but with a different interpretation. Of course, the maths is not very different. But what you can do, what you can prove, is if you define Q as this quantity, the multiplier of the generic temperatures, the ones of GG times the constants of motion, you have this fluctuation theorem that tells you something about the changes of the constants of motion, how much they change. The probability that they change by a bit, the probability that they change over minus a bit. Now it's not two systems connected. Now the connection in the system is the breaking of integrability or the breaking of conservation of those quantities. So the system is talking to itself and what separates two parts of the system is not a separation, a physical separation, but is the fact that you have constants of motion. And your little wire is the small coupling that breaks the conservation of these quantities. Okay? So just quickly to say, this is like all fluctuation theorems, very easy to prove. And it says something about how the system progresses toward equilibrium and sometimes regresses, because this is the same idea here. The, 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 the big quantity, this is a big quantity, the probability of going that way if T1 is larger than T2 is big. The probability of heat going from cold to hot is very small. This is a generalization of the second principle because it tells you that overwhelmingly it's much more probable that this happens than this, and precisely the ratio is given by that. The same happens with a system that is almost integrable here we change. So what is nice about this fluctuation theorem is that usually these theorems concern very small quantities that are the reverse quantities, heat going from cold to hot. And that's usually not easy to observe. You, have to, you need either very short times or a very a small system. Here, the smallness comes from the smallness in the breaking of conservation. That's our, our, our little wire. So I think it, it, it might be much more observable than the usual one. But that's... So here, in the case of Fermi Pastaulam, it could uh, represent the death of solitons because some of the constants of motions are related to the number of solitons. Okay, just two little examples and I'm done. Um, you could play the game with three glasses of water coupled by three little wires of different uh, thicknesses. And again, uh, there is one 
global constant of motion, which is the total energy, and two that are uh, the other two differences, independent differences, that are almost constants. And now in those two almost constants, you wonder what will happen. And you could do a GGE, meaning that you have Gibbs, Gibbs, Gibbs with three different temperatures. One is the sum is the true temperature that says something about the global energy of the system. The other two are a generalization, they are drifting slowly. To what do they drift? Well, remember that inverse temperature is a Lagrange multiplier. When you equilibrate that degree of freedom, the Lagrange multiplier is not imposing anything. When a Lagrange multiplier doesn't impose anything, it is zero. So the inverse temperatures of things that are decaying go to zero, so the, the temperatures go to infinity. And that's what you expect to happen, that they go to zero. And the fluctuation theorem tells you that the way in which they do is that you have, for example, here three, it's not the previous example, because one of them was constant in the previous, these are three that are non-constant. You have surfaces of constant entropy, and you can show that, convince yourself that the fluctuation theorem tells you, and something that you already know, that you go skiing downhill, downhill in minus the total entropy, so you have surfaces of constant entropy, you go skiing. Why do I say skiing? Because skiing is not along a gradient. If you ski along a gradient, you end up very quickly. So uh, you have to go downhill, but not necessarily along a gradient, but you have to go downhill. That's in the thermodynamic limit. The fluctuation theorem tells you something about the violation of that. You go down and occasionally a little bit you go up. And the quotient of these two quantities is what the fluctuation theorem gives you. Okay, but in any case, the more impo most important message here is that the motion of a system that is quasi-integrable and, and macroscopic is to make its slowly adiabatically changing extra temperatures go slowly to infinity. That's, that's at the end of the day what it's all about. Okay, so I think I better stop here. chain with, uh, on, with different energy in the different wave numbers. You don't see any recurrence? Yes, 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 yes. So it wasn't visible? In... Um, you see recurrence, but the recurrence, you see it in... Um, so uh, the recurrence, you see it, for example, if I start with a soliton that sort of seems to spread and comes back and recurs, from the point of view of that constant of motion, the one that describes this soliton, nothing has changed. So the recurrence, or put it in another way, if you had pure Toda, you would have all the recurrences in the world. But seen from the point of view of the constant of motion of Toda, you have no motion at all. The recurrence is the angle variable, if you want, in the, in the, in the torus. So you're not changing torus, so if you look at it from the point of view of who are your total constants, they stay constant. But this angle here gives you, when you apply Toda in space, a recurrence, an apparent recurrence. And these are, this is exactly because you have a soliton that is going and coming back. And so Suppose uh, we wish to find the change in action in the FPU problem, uh, when we are trying to approach it from total lattice, all we can do is uh, find the how eigen, eigenvalues are changing with time. So from that, can we say something about how actions are changing with time? Um, so we tried, uh, it's a way, using perturbation theory, for example, for diagonalizing a matrix that is changing, that's a practical way to, to measure the, the changes. But still, the changes are due to the extra small terms that are destroying, that, that make you not be a true Toda. And these extra terms are difficult to take into account analytically. What, what, what I feel, and that was my motivation, is that these interaction terms of higher order are very much like noise that is corrupting your system and, and making 
they're not negligible, right? Because the separation between the particles, we have neglected higher powers, power four, power five. We don't know in advance whether they are less than one or something. No? Uh, uh, whether they are large, you yes. mean? Well, uh, because everything scales with energy, the higher powers are the least important when the energy is lower. This is why the breaking of, as you go up in energy for that, for Fermi Pasta Ulam, you're further and further away from Toda. At very, very low temperatures, you're even very close to free waves. As you go up, you see some nice solitons that stay alive forever, and that says that you're almost Toda. As you go further up, then it becomes more mixed. Further up in time or energy? <coughs> Further up, you meant? When you go up, if you consider larger energies, yes, yes. No, not what, in time. What about CAM theorem? Like, when can we think of using it in FPU? Problem? If you make a total lattice of three particles, then it will be relevant. Uh, I don't know exactly, but the estimation is that the volume of surviving tori of CAM is exponential in the number of degrees. The multiplicative process that everybody properly for the system to behave properly. Uh, this is not a theorem, but... Uh, and if it's so, by the time you... And so it goes like the interaction, uh, the integrability breaking parameter to the power of number of degrees of freedom. So very quickly, but now, how to see cam tori? How big you can? Uh, well, it depends on the parameters, no. But uh, he, he, I don't know if anybody did a, a precise study on this. But it's here again. It's it's a cultural question, no? We we are all so formatted by cam that um, and so formatted by low dimensional thinking that we, we wouldn't be if we were doing any other problem in our lives, which we treat immediately thermodynamically. But for dynamics, for some reason, we are all low dimensional. But it's a problem of our education, I think, <laughs> rather than... Uh, uh, yes and no. So if you have... Uh, there are problems, definitely, where you have two asteroids, I don't know, doing something, I don't know. So there are small subsystems that definitely are low dimensional. Now, when you... Um, so, for example, one thing I know is that if you do Pluto plus Neptune, which live in some form of synchronization, plus the big planets, then you have regions that are like this, like gamma. The moment you add the small planets, then it seems that those regions disappear. So it's a very, very small perturbation. So um, it's sitting in the middle. Um, but notice that, as I said, the Lyapunov is big. Uh, so they are, they are behaving like a rather chaotic system. And um, so, so I don't know. They're sitting somewhere in the middle. Uh, coming... You cannot apply something thermodynamic. In this, we agree. But thinking it as the extension of a two, three the degree of freedom problem, three, four degree of freedom problem, is, is not good either. It, it's, it makes you think that very probably it will be stable or things like that, and it is not, and it's very far from having zero Lyapunov. You know? So it's sort of intermediate, I would guess. And no, even, uh, I don't know that way, but uh, one nice thing to, to say a bit more or less what you're saying is uh, 
you expect that in some of these curves, Mercury's orbit blows up, but it doesn't fall down. You could ask why, I mean, this inter... And quick answer from a stat Mac person is because the Torah you would go to, that, that where Mercury is far bigger, have more volume and phase space. So you would... Volume equals e to the entropy. So it is natural that you tend to evolve to that. Because it's not thermodynamics, this is not strictly so, but at least you would expect it to go rather in that direction. You won't find this set this way in books of classical mechanics. I don't, I don't think so. Because that's the way we think. But not. So, so just being able to, to do like an entropic guess of what happens even to a system that is moderate in size, rather small, like the solar system, this is not the way they, they speak, the, the, the planetary people speak. Of course, they know why, I'm not criticizing, but it's a different culture. So what controls the separation between these two time scales? In the so the, the one for Lyapunov is this epsilon to the one-third or two-thirds, depending on how you... Mm -hmm. And the other one is epsilon squared or something like that. So for epsilon small, you can have a, a Lyapunov time that is much, much larger than... Mm -hmm. It goes with epsilon, of course. If you do epsilon, that is... A bit, this was for, for random noise, but I guess it would be the case for all non, weakly non-integrable systems. But, uh, I mean, due to the fact that we have a multi multiplicative noise, we have, like, it's not, uh, it's not symmetric, right? We have, we have drift, maybe, and, and there is always uh, a way to, to not where the drift uh, will bring, I mean, if, if it will shrink the action or if it will uh, enlarge the Torah. And usually it enlarges it because it's, this is related to the previous question. Oh. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And uh, yes, yes, you're right. Uh, once you wrote it as a multiplicative noise, yeah. then you know it's more or less random inside. But you're random inside, but you're sitting on a torus. And most of, because of volume things in high, not very high, but more or less high dimensions, to be kicked out and to be kicked in has different probabilities. Yes, that's the kind of way of thinking that is typical of stat mech people. Uh, it's less typical of dynamical system people. And because we have two different biases, we are coming from very high dimension and trying to apply it to low, and they are coming from very low and trying to apply it to medium. It's a matter of education. Uh, no, the scaling within you can you can you can you can make it so that it's sort of extensive in some. What it scales with is energy density, and then it it, it depends. I remember a big power law. It's not exponential like you would expect in glasses. It's sort of energy density to the eighth, right? If I remember correctly. So so that's more or less estimation. Yeah, um, there have been uh, works like this where they tried analytically to... When you do this project that our program does stupidly, when you try to be intelligent and really integrate and estimate that, that's what weak turbulence people do. And there is at least one paper where, where they get this exponent, which if I'm not mistaken is eight. So it's a very big one. Uh, but yes, you, you, can, you can do that. What you don't have is any... When you send n to infinity and you scale things properly, you don't see any... Your cam uh, level went exponentially with n down to zero. So, to put it more, less passionately, the cam regime is valid for exponentially low temperatures. 
is applicable, not valid. Valid is always 